update. Okay, so you see reduce it. Okay, so that's fine. Yeah, yeah. That so yeah. Sorry, maybe that may have happened on, on when we've been. Uh, sure, sure. Not a problem. I, I can aim for twenty minutes. Yeah, I cut down my slides a bit just now. So very good. Thanks a lot. So can you see my slides? Yes. So I think we will wait a couple of minutes as people are still filing in. Okay, so we are quickly uh, approaching the standard opening delay of four minutes. So this is the summer summary meeting of the Think to Think uh, research group. Uh, I'm Carsten Bormann, Ari Karen is with me chairing that uh, group. Uh, this is an IRTF meeting, which means that the IPR guidelines of the IETF apply. This is the short form of the note well. There's also a long form, which reminds you that if you are talking about uh, technology where the, you know about patent claims, you, you have to disclose that, or you can not talk about that technology. Um, 
we are in, in a standards meeting where we try to be uh, nice to each other and be productive uh, and so on. And uh, this is an IRTF meeting, so we are not developing standards here. We are uh, trying to get uh, research um, done. Um, so uh, we are not going to <clears throat> uh, check whether a new specification that has to be implemented by everyone has uh, is getting working group adoption or something like that. We are just trying to uh, collect interesting content. So um, we don't have to do anything about uh, blue sheets because that's uh, handled by uh, Meet Echo. Uh, there is uh, uh, there are notes. If you go into the chat, you will find a, a link to the notes. So if you want to, the, the CODIMD IETF org link, if you want to contribute to the notes or just want to read the uh, weird words that we are using in this uh, research group, uh, go there. It's useful to have that open. Um, there, there's also a Jabber group, which is replicated here by Meet Echo in its chat. Uh, we have a mailing list and uh, we uh, also have a repository where we try to collect things uh, relevant uh, to this meeting. So those were the preliminaries. Um, the agenda today uh, is uh, packed, but I hope not overly so. Um, so we want to give a quick report of what has been going on in the last four months. Uh, and then we will get various uh, reports on, on other SDOs. This time, uh, W3C Web of Things and uh, 1DM by two of the three Michaels that we'll be presenting uh, today. Uh, Xavier will then talk about the research group draft, IoT edge challenges and functions. And uh, Mohit and Michael will talk about the research group draft, secure bootstrapping, and the uh, IDEF ID considerations that goes with that. So that's our program for today. Anything we need to change here? OK, in which case, um, I think this is a pretty in-group uh, audience here, so I probably can can do this very, very quickly. Uh, so in the research group, we look at open research issues in, in making a true Internet of Things uh, happen. And since this is a giant area, we are really focusing on uh, issues where we have opportunities for IETF uh, standardization. And um, yeah, we, we are Living in a context, uh, the, the one of the useful things about the IETF is that it's close to the IETF. Uh, so we have uh, various IETF working groups that we are in interfacing uh, with, but I think most people here know that, so I think I can um, skip that quickly. Uh, let's talk about uh, planning for, for a short time. Could do this at the end, but usually it, it's uh, useful to get this out of the way. Um, so we are going back to regular wishy calls, approximately monthly, monthly, except that we will have a <clears throat> bigger gap now in the summer because people are on vacation um, in the uh, north half of the world. Uh, we decided to have this meeting not at IETF 111, but a month earlier uh, now. Uh, but uh, in July, we will have a, a Wishy Hackathon Week in the IETF Hackathon uh, context. So that's July 19th to 23. If you're interested in code, I will talk about that in a minute. Uh, we are also looking at meetings with other SDOs, um, like OCF or OMA or W3C. W3C has, has an open day next week. I'm sure Michael McCool will talk about uh, that uh, and uh, that, that's something that many of us will want to go to. Uh, we are also looking at academic conferences. N nothing uh, can be announced right now, but uh, I hope uh, we, we can say something about that soon. 
And uh, <clears throat> we are all longing for a physical meeting, but it looks like that might be difficult. And somehow I'm presenting the wrong slides. How did this happen? Ari, can you do me a favor and present the right slides? Job status. I didn't hear that. Uh, I, would the next slide be the research group document status? Or yes. But okay. some. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, okay. I, I just <clears throat> I thought I had made an edit and and that uh, somehow was lost. Um, ah. <laughs> so, um, we have several documents that are, uh, ha that have a research group document status um, that is almost but not entirely unlike working group documents in the IETF. So, these are documents where, where the research group thinks it's good to, to pay some attention to them. Um, and th these uh, may be worth publishing when uh, completed. We have the RESTful Design for IoT document uh, that, that is in progress. There's actually a, a big pull request right now in the GitHub. And uh, the plan is to, to get this done in 2021. Um, there is a little uh, technical or legal technical problem in getting the authors of this document to meet because of US embargo um, issues. So it, it's always a little bit uh, overhead to to make progress on this, but uh, there will be another author and interested people uh, meeting real soon now. The second one is the agent IT document, which we will talk today, talk about today, which is uh, uh, also likely to be completed this year. Um, and <clears throat> the third one is the secure bootstrapping uh, document that we will talk about later today. Um, th there is work going on on an information modeling standards description. So something that we have been calling nutrition labels for, for information modeling uh, informally. And uh, we had some discussion about that in the uh, wishing meeting on, on uh, last Thursday. And uh, um, we will continue that work. And finally, there are various activities that happen in the Wishy Wiki, for instance, Wishy Notes. Uh, these are not research group documents in, in the sense of, of an internet draft, but this is uh, work that uh, we are uh, working on. So, Ari, do you want to take over? Sure, I, I can take this one. So. In, in the wishy work, um, we had a meeting last week. Um, it's been a few months since the last meeting. Um, and in the few months ago, we started a discussion with the Microsoft Azure Digital Twins definition language team on how their work on, on, on that, that language and the work we done at the IETF on the SDF, how they relate to each other and how we could perhaps make them interwork. So the, yeah, last week, we had a follow-up meeting, continued the good discussions we started on the first time. And in particular, we touch upon a part of topics on, first of all, on the SDF and data enhancements. So we are, of course, all the time evolving SDF to better uh, be able to express different things uh, from different ecosystems. But then also we discussed that perhaps also DDL could be added some features so that there, some things we can express in, in, in SDF could be brought to the DDL ecosystem. We also discussed uh, external ontologies uh, with SDF and, and DTL. So there are a lot of domain-specific work uh, done out there on, on the IoT systems and how we can reuse that uh, with, with the different ecosystems and how we can translate that kind of uh, relations and, and other semantics brought by those ecosystems into SDF and, and DTDL. One long-standing discussion when it comes to IoT data models have, of course, been this alignment and use of engineering units. So many ways to do the same things. Um, luckily, with SDF and DDL, we're both already using SI units. But then again, DDL has extended uh, a bit further beyond uh, simple SI units. So we're discussing what's the best ways we can express them in SDF and, and DDL 
to enable automated conversion and, and interoperability. Also, we have an, now two implementations um, for SDF DTDL, so conversion programs for one, one each direction. Um, we've been using those to do a bit of a proof of concept work and, and pressure testing on SDF and, and, and DTDL. And finally, we did discuss that it would be very useful to further share uh, the models and also convert the models and, and share the results um, openly so that we can, we can learn um, about both ecosystems, but then also learn more how they can work well together. Another topic we discussed was this SDF Yang conversion. So as you know, Yang is one of those IETF uh, data models. Um, but then Jana, the main author of that work, will be presenting that shortly. So I won't go into details here. And finally, the last piece of work we discussed in the Wishing meeting was IoT information model standard description. As and as Karsten mentioned, there's a thing thing draft forthcoming on that topic. Then on the next slide, um, a bit of a wishy work in future. So plan is to have a next meeting around September after summer vacations. Already we identified that we certainly do need a follow-up on the DTDL topic. So we'll continue that with the Microsoft Azure team. And then also we'll be continuing the discussions on the STF Young, Young conversions. We were hoping to have a chance to talk about all the W3C Web of Things thing models last week, but unfortunately we ran out of time. So we decided it's better to have that discussion also properly after the summer vacations. And finally, we have a, an SDF topic bubbling under it. We've been planning to tackle for quite some time. It's what we've been calling mapping files uh, for SDF. So it's really about attaching additional information to the SDF models that you have defined with SDF and working for example, instances and classes and composition. So that's our plan and current status of the wishy work. Any questions or comments here? Okay, if no questions, then we can move forward. Karsten. Oh, I see. Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just amazed by, by Meet Echo, which saw me unmuting. And I, then I didn't immediately say something, and uh, it told me, oh, you are not saying something, uh, which is uh, very nice. OK, um, so uh, Ari already mentioned that uh, there's work on an SDF uh, Yang converter. And, and uh, uh, we have uh, cut out five minutes for, for Jana, who's writing that. A converter to talk about that. Maybe first give uh, an overview of what what is actually being converted there, and then give a, a, a short overview over the tool that you can use uh, today uh, to play with this. So Jana, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Carsten. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Jana. I'm a student at the University of. Uh, Bremen, and I'm writing my master thesis currently um, with Carsten as my supervisor. I'm working on um, a SDF Yang converter. And today I just want to show you a selection of mappings uh, between the two formats to just give you a quick introduction, uh, because I could also use your help um, in evaluating the, the mappings that I've come up with so far. Uh, for those of you who don't know Yang that well, it's a, a modeling language used for data send over um, network management protocols such as NetConf, for example. Uh, can I get the next slide or do I have to do it on my, yeah, thanks. Uh, so first uh, I'm going to show you a quick overview of mapping between Yang and SDF because then I can uh, explain the Yang statements to you as well. Um, at the top level of Yang, because Yang is um, organized as a tree structure, there's the Yang module. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is translated to the SDF model, so the thing that consists of the info block, namespace section, and definitions. Then in Yang, you've got containers who can contain um, any of the other nodes. Uh, this is a little bit trickier. It's uh, either translated to SDF objects if the container um, occurs at the top level or to SDF property of the compound type, so um, of type object, which can have um, properties. This happens if uh, the container is a child, no child node of a top level container, 
because that top level container would have um, been converted to SDF object. Um, and a container can also be converted to um, compound type, uh, to a property of a compound type element if it occurs at any other level. Um, the same basically happens for list nodes. List nodes are the same as containers, so they can contain other nodes with the difference uh, that this assertion of uh, other nodes then can occur uh, multiple times in the uh, data tree. So uh, in case of a top level or one level uh, below list, uh, the list is converted to SDF property. Um, and if it occurs at any other level, it is uh, translated to um, the property of a compound type element again. And in both cases, um, the type is array and the um, items of the array are of type object uh, because the list has um, well, complex, complex um, items. So then there's also the leaf list. The difference of a leaf list is that uh, it only contains um, simple type, um, yeah, simple types. So uh, this is also translated very similarly to what I told you before. Um, if a leaf list occurs at the top level, uh, one level below, it is again translated to SDF property um, of type array now with items of simple types or it is translated to a property um, of a compound type. Again, um, the types array and the items are simple types on any other level. Um, leave nodes are um, just simple type nodes that occur um, a single time. So this is again, same concept, SDF property of a simple type uh, if the leaf occurs at top level or one level below, or again, um, the property uh, of a compound type uh, on any other level. And then there's also type depths and groupings, uh, which are uh, basically derived types that can be used elsewhere. Um, so type def is uh, translated to SDF data of a simple type because the type def can only have a simple type. And a grouping is translated to uh, SDF data of a compound type. So this is more straightforward. Um, so on the next slide, uh, I will tell you something about the other direction. Um, we have about 15 seconds left. <laughs> okay, so SDF model is again translated to module, SDF thing, SDF object to container, pretty straightforward. Um, and SDF property is also translated to container uh, in case it is a compound type. So it is um, complex type. And then again, if it is of simple type, then this translate to a leaf, leaf list, or a list. Um, and since the last slide is the most important slide, can you please switch to that? Um, what I wanted to tell you about actually is my converter demo, which you can find at sdf slash yang slash converter.org, where you can try out the converter yourself so you don't have to uh, install it from GitHub and all that stuff. Uh, and yeah, I would really appreciate feedback on uh, the conversions because there were some issues that came up um, with conversions that aren't uh, as straightforward as the ones I told you about. Uh, and yeah, thanks for your attention. You can find the converter at sdf slash yang converter slash yang slash converter dot org. And also there's a link to the GitHub if you need uh, more information on there. Uh, thanks for your attention and thanks, Karsten. Thanks, Jan. So uh, just to remind people, if we want to discuss this, we can do this on the Think You Think Research uh, group list. So don't don't be sh shy about uh, uh, talking about things you found there. And if we get too detailed, of course, we can start to take things off list. But I think uh, right now we are not in, in danger of drowning uh, from the Think You Think Research group uh, list. So thank you for that. And uh, if, if you have uh, Yang models for IoT things, please throw them at this uh, tool and, and tell us uh, whether what you got in SDF form is, is useful. So this is an example of, of a, a piece of uh, software. And uh, we, we are going to spend uh, more time uh, on uh, software a month from now, or four weeks from now, uh, at the uh, IETF 111 Hackathon Week. 
So again, we are not meeting at the IT, ITF 111 itself, but uh, we are meeting at the hackathon week that pre uh, precedes it. And uh, we want to have a wishy call on the first day, on the Monday, probably at 1400 uh, UTC. Uh, and uh, then probably we'll just have uh, daily uh, synchronization calls because most of the work, of course, is is going to uh, happen uh, on the on the web on the internet. So we will throw models at each other's uh, tools and and see what what happens uh, and so on. So we will uh, have uh, a daily call, also probably around the time, maybe a little bit later uh, in, in the day, depending on how uh, people uh, feel. So converters, of course, the DTDL converter that, that uh, Ericsson brought to the table, the, the SDF Yang converter, the various uh, what converters that are out there. There's some pretty interesting stuff out there. And uh, I hope we, we will be able to uh, get the various authors of the various tools uh, together in this hackathon so we can exchange uh, information. And uh, certainly, we also want to de uh, continue developing this mapping file or adding information uh, uh, work. We don't really have uh, tools that we can point to at this point in time. Um, but um, yeah, by, by then, maybe we have uh, the, the first tools um, out there. OK, any questions about the Hackathon Week? In which case, I can hand over to uh, uh, Michael. Do you want to present your own slides? Yes, I will do that right now. One second. Okay. Um, so I'm asking to send my screen. Yes, and I have to press a button here. OK. And OK, you should see it now. And of course, it closed it as soon as I shared. Thank you so much. OK. All right. So I'm going to do a quick update of the work on Web of Things. Um, and I actually have a fair amount of material. Sorry for the long slides. The ones I uploaded, I'm going to skip over a bunch of slides and material I uploaded. So you can look at that later on to get more material. And I'm just going to very quickly do a summary in case people haven't seen it before although I'm sure 90% of people here have. But basically, the Web of Things is working on adapting web technology to IoT within the context of W3C. Uh, two years ago, we actually published a uh, thing description metadata format, which is somewhat similar to, um, to things like DTDL and, uh, and SDF, but it focuses on describing an instance of a device but it gives you the network interface and it gives you uh, metadata about the device. And it also is based in JSON-LD, so it supports uh, things like web semantics. And the general idea is provide kind of a, a, uh, a common abstraction to uh, interface between applications and uh, different uh, other different standards. Now, currently in our current charter, we are updating that to uh, TD 1.1 to fill in various gaps which I will discuss. We've also introduced thing models, which is describing a class of devices as opposed to a single instance. And this correlates much more strongly with things like SDF. Um, we've also been working on discovery, which is a runtime mechanism to, to find metadata, and profiles, which are a set of constraints on, on descriptions to satisfy certain implementation requirements and to enhance interoperability. So I'm going to discuss each of these. Let me just very quickly talk about uh, TVs themselves and give a little example. So basically, it's a JSON-LD file. Um, so that means it has an at context, which defines the vocabulary. Sorry about that. And it, um, it also has high-level uh, metadata. It has a, a description of the required security to talk to the device. And then a set of properties, events, and actions. And each property, event, and action 
includes forms, which give you the uh, basically the protocol-based URLs for talking to the device, and then also data schemas for how to set up and interpret data for the device. And the basic idea is that the properties, events, and actions are an abstraction that describe you know what you can do, and the details in the forms and the data schema tell you how to do it. <clears throat> the data schemas are described in a variant of JSON schema, but they're meant to be applicable to uh, other uh, payloads to CBOR. And this actually aligns closely with a similar idea in uh, SDN. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about you know, just the updates. So what are we doing in uh, in the thing description, where we're doing discovery, we're doing profiles. <clears throat> so in thing description, so we are constrained somewhat by the desire in this iteration to be back compatible. So we're not making certain changes uh, that would break compatibility. We're kind of holding off for those on TD 2.0. And I will say that our current charter uh, was meant to be done end of December. We're likely to be adding for an extension just to meet some deadlines uh, for the process. Uh, we'll probably be wrapping up the 1.1 sometime mid-fall at the latest. Um, and then we were starting work on 2.2. We are currently in discussion about what exactly goes into our charter for next round, uh, but we'll definitely do a TD 2.0. But I will say that the thing model we have right now is essentially a template for a thing description. And because a thing description lacks certain features that map onto SDF, the most mo notable of which is the SDF object, so a mechanism for modularity uh, at the syntactic level, um, that's the kind of thing we probably need to uh, look at for TD 2.0. So uh, now in TD 1.1, we have a bunch of small extensions. So we've updated you know, uh, the schemas to be more aligned with JSON schema. Uh, we've uh, added some formal validation levels, indicate precisely what you have to do when you validate things uh, for TD, et cetera. Um, one of the bigger things that has happened recently is we've been looking at signing and, val and canonicalization. So we've defined a canonical form of the TD that basically removes various variant ways to describe things. So there's a unique way to map between the information model and the serialization. And then you can, and the main purpose of that is to do signing so that you can take a serialization and compute a signature for it and then know that the information has been, uh, hasn't been changed. And the canonical form is to allow it to survive going into and out of a database, for example, without breaking the signature. Now, work in progress is actually a signature PR. Um, I will summarize uh, that later, but basically we're looking at extending uh, GWS. Now for discovery, um, we have a new spec for that. And it's, as I'll mention later on, it's a two-phase mechanism, but it has relationships to DNSSD, DID, Core RD. We're also defining a directory service API, which is a HTTP web service, provides a database, lets you do search, searching uh, database of TDs. We also have the ability to self-describe, so uh, have self-description of devices. Uh, profiles, set of constraints. I will say we're focusing, I think, on what I call the hub use case, where you have uh, a thing that prevents HTTP JSON on one side, and on the back side talks to various other protocols. And that use case has come up several times. OK, so again, 1.1, uh, looking at colonization. So the basic idea here is not reinvent you know, encryption mechanisms for signatures themselves. So the proposal is based on JWS and JWA, including RFC 8037, which covers the newer elliptic, uh, elliptical curve signature mechanisms. Um, however, there's still the question of what the input to that signature should be. 
and it needs to be kind of a, uh, a JSON object. So um, there's actually kind of an XML signature inspired mechanisms to extract subparts of a TD that then be fed as input into the signature mechanism. And I will also say that the signature then is encapsulated and stored inside the TD, and there's a, a mechanism to do that. So that's uh, currently on the table under discussion. Um, and uh, you're welcome to look at that. Um, security scheme improvements. Um, there were a couple devices we came across that embedded security keys inside URLs, which we didn't have a way to describe. And one example of that is actually the Hue light bulb. So we um, extended uh, URI security schemes to support URI templates where the key might get embedded into the URI. I don't think this is a especially good design pattern, but we're trying to describe existing devices, including ones we don't necessarily agree with. So that was added. There's also uh, a similar mechanism where people might put keys into a payload alongside other stuff that is actually real payload. And so we added a mechanism to describe that as well. And finally, we uh, explicitly allow the OAuth device flow, which is uh, an extension of the OAuth spec for IoT devices, basically. Um, a really big thing is the TD thing model. And the idea of the thing model is sort of a class of devices. This used to be called thing templates. And it is, in fact, a template. In fact, we use something similar to URI templates. And we also use URI templates to parameterize a TM. And you basically have to fill in various parameters and also fill in missing fields to get a TD when you instantiate it. There's also a set of relation types that relate TDs to TMs and TMs to each other. So the basic mechanism here is that a TD can reference only one and only one TM. Um, and so the idea is we don't do complicated things like multiple inheritance in the TD. The TD just instantiates one TM. But the TM itself has a more complicated mechanism for reading in uh, other TMs that it's extending or even extracting parts of TMs. And we're trying to, to align this with um, SDF. The major constraint, as I mentioned, is that because we're trying to be Docker compatible, we can't add major new features uh, like uh, uh, containers. And so we're going to reserve that for 2D 2.0. But it, it might still be possible if we only allow them in TMs. So that's uh, something we can discuss if we can get it done quickly before our, our next uh, uh, round of specs. Okay, uh, for discovery, um, this is just a review, but basically the discovery mechanism is how do you get metadata? Um, one of our major constraints is to support privacy. So we want to make sure that you know we're not uh, broadcasting data that may have privacy implications. So we try to hide most of the complicated metadata behind a secure interface. And we actually hide that behind a web API. So we use existing web mechanisms to protect data. But we still want to use uh, onboarding um, sort of first contact mechanisms that can leverage existing open discovery mechanisms. So the idea is to have like a two-phase introduction phase that's open, and then an authorization mechanism, and then have a closed or, or protected exploration mode that gives you detailed metadata. We also need to protect the actual queries themselves. So you need to also bootstrap security before you can submit queries. Um, and we also do want to align with existing standards, mostly to use existing standards as uh, these first contact mechanisms. Uh, next slide. Right, this is what it said. I'm just going to skip that. But again, we have this two-phase mechanism. The current status is we basically are in the phase where we're, we have the spec mostly written, and now we're trying to figure out how to test it. Under introductions, we have a few uh, normative uh, extensions. So in particular, for things that have a service type, like DNSSD, we have to define some service types. 
ultimately a discovery the introduction phase gives you a URL. It's helpful that URL as a type to distinguish pointing directly at a thing versus pointing at a directory, but it's not mandatory because when you go to a directory, a directory gives you information that tells you it's a directory. But it kind of helps to skip a step if you have a type on the uh, URL. So for example, for DNSSD, we have two different types, one for a thing and one for a directory service. And similarly for DID and CoreRD, we'll have resource types and endpoint types that distinguish those two things. Um, but for other cases like well-known URLs or direct, which is simply you get a URL and you go to it, we don't have any way to attach a type. And so you have to resolve that type dynamically. For exploration, there's two major categories. One is kind of the smart object approach, where you get a TD directly from the thing. And the other is you get a directory service. And the directory service is basically a database that uh, TDs can be registered with. And then you can query the database to find TDs. And you can use syntactic queries. And we support both JSON path and XPath, the uh, JSON version of XPath, JSON XPath 3.0 and then Sparkle. So XPath and Sparkle are optional, uh, but JSON path is mandatory. Uh, one of our issues with JSON path, though, is it isn't quite a standard. Well, there is a draft RFC now with IETF for JSON path. So we're kind of trying to intercept that. Um, so when it comes out as a standard, we'll be able to, to use it. If it's not quite ready yet, we may have to make XPath be the mandatory uh, version and JSON path the optional. Uh, we want to have at so, least one be mandatory you can depend on it. Yes. Michael, if I can, can interject there. Um, so I think the JSON path working group would be really interested in your requirements. So what, what do you need JSON path to have to do? Um, right now we are, the general sentiment is that we will have something like a minimum viable product uh, in, in the uh, first RFC. Um, right. But uh, if, if there's something you need, we need to know. Yeah, and I think what we need to do is we're able to a bunch of use cases and examples uh, to clarify that. Uh, the main thing we need that's different from the current, you know, uh, version is we have to limit the power of, you know, J JavaScript snippets. So we don't want to be able to have to be able to do uh, injection attacks on on directory servers. So we need to limit the not the comparisons that can be done and the the scripts to like just a small subset. That's yeah, that, that's already in the, the current no, document. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, we, we do need uh, input what you actually need to be able to do and what we can leave out. Well, I will say our main issue right now is timing. So we don't have a lot of time to make fancy requests. What we really need is to have a minimum viable product out so we can reference, to it, reference it. And then we can do fancier things in, in the Discovery 2.0 next year. So I, I think what we want right now is just the minimum viable thing. Uh, I think we at least want to have equivalent functionality to JSON pointer, right? Be able to select a particular, yeah. you know, element. That should be easy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, anyway, Sparkle is like, you know, all singing, all dancing version. But because it's expensive to implement, it is optional. Um, there's also various other things involved in the spec, like pagination, so you can go through long TDs, et cetera. Uh, I will say right now we're focused on HTTP and JSON, and probably next round we'll look at uh, you know um, CoAP and Cbor. So right now we're not trying to target uh, everything; we're just doing uh, HTTP or uh, web web service. Um, sorry, I got to move on because I run out of time here. Uh, profiles and constraints. So profiles just try to constrain things. As I said, we're, we're focused on just the hub functionality which translates a bunch of different standards into one HTTP JSON. And we also want to make sure the implementation is finite, finitely implementable. So the finite set of things that it has to do. Uh, because the TV is pretty open-ended, we wanted to like limit it to make it implementable and make it validatable. So this is just a set of constraints to be able to let that happen. I won't go through this in detail. Just the idea that we only allow a certain finite set of things. And we're currently doing a sort of baseline. And we also are trying to, you know, clarify things like, you know, what are the error codes and what do they mean and so forth. 
Um, I will say as well, another activity going on right now is a smart city workshop. And this overlaps with what in the sense of use cases. So this is a slide that I'm doing at the workshop, which is being held on the 25th. Um, and what we're trying to do here is engage with smart city uh, stakeholders to define not just Web of Things requirements, but you know, general web services and other kinds of requirements for smart cities. So we also have a use case document we've been working on, and these are some use cases from that document that relate to smart cities. But there's lots of others. Uh, but like for example, land management needs some, some geolocation uh, use case uh, uh, information. We don't currently have any standard for you know, embedding standardized geolocation information into a TD. So that's something we're considering for our 2.0 version to make that standardized, which relates to a use case like land management or construction. Uh, but even cultural space like a museum, you might want to describe what room you're in, for example. We have no standardized way of doing that. Um, OK. So I need to move along here, but I just want to say uh, there's a bunch of resources. So there are current specs out for this. Uh, this is actually pointing at the editor's version of the document, which in some cases is well aligned with the current working draft. In some cases, like discovery, the editor's draft is quite a bit ahead now of the working draft. So I suggest in general that you look at the editor's drafts. Uh, we also have some informative documents, and the biggest one is probably the use case and requirements document, which includes a lot of discussion about you know, various use cases. We also recently updated our website. So there's a brand spanking new website out now that has a better way to, to access uh, the various stuff we're doing. And one of the things we need to work on right now is um, things like tutorials, which is something that is in progress. But we have like uh, explainer videos like this happening now. And that's it. So I will stop there. And if there's any time for questions, I'll take them. Otherwise, we can move on. Thank you for keeping your time very nicely. Maybe you can advance one more slide, because there are the people uh, people should be talking to. Thank you. Right. Well, so, we have one moment I just want to mention. We are rechartering, and we are looking at what to do for our next charter. In terms of alignment with SDF and other things, we definitely want to get aligned, but we have time constraints. We have to finish our current round and get through the process and then start a new version. And so I think our current goal is to clean up what we have now, get it in the can, and then we will have a chance to discuss you know, major new things to do very soon for our next charter. So are there any questions? Well, I cut in with my question in the middle of, of the talk. I'm sorry about that. So I hope we will get uh, keep to uh, keep getting continuous updates about the W3C work because it's very relevant to uh, what we are uh, doing here. And thank you, Michael, for reporting. So the next thing on the agenda um, is uh, another Michael, Michael Costa, with an update on one DM. Michael, can you show your slides? You have to press this, yes. But you, you actually have to click on the, yes, this one, exactly. Sorry, it wasn't responding at first, and um, I didn't know what was happening. So here we go. Can you see the slides now? I'm, I'm not sure how the sharing works. Well, the, you should still have to select what you're sharing on your side. OK. I, I don't see where that. Oh, OK, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Oh, yeah, OK. Yes. So you must be able to see that. And let me just maybe go into full screen mode. OK, so this is a, an update on one data model. 
I'm assuming uh, everyone sort of has a, an idea of what one data model is, but um, what we're doing is using the SDF language to, um, to drive for a common data model or uh, common, in other words, that uh, uh, one data model that everyone can use, hence the name one data model, for the common IoT affordance patterns like on-off control and color control of a light and temperature sensing and thermostatic control and things like that. So I'm going to go through what um, you know where we are and and sort of we depend on SDF, but we've we've moved the SDF work. Um, completely out of one data model and, and um, that standardization is in process and we're, we're just uh, going to use whatever is, is uh, uh, done by, one, uh, by STF and provide requirements. So we're kind of doing a pressure test of STF right now um, and we're looking at a couple of new features as Ari mentioned. But uh, the main body of work is uh, around the convergence of data models across industry. So currently we have about 200 models, I think it's about 195 models in the playground, uh, contributed mostly from OMA, Lightweight M2M and OCF, but we have some examples from Bluetooth Mesh and the Zigbee cluster library in there as well. And we've, uh, we've determined what process we want to use for uh, convergence, and that is sort of a model adoption process where we're, we're going to basically have a, an official adopted 1DM model that's uh, adopted through a consensus process. And we've, uh, we've also sort of figured out how we want to uh, manage the life cycle of models and track them and version them and how documentation would be uh, handled. And we have some uh, small set, very small set of initial models that we want to use to uh, for the first run of the process. So going forward, we, um, we've already agreed on the adoption process. We're, uh, we're about a, a quarter or so, a few months behind where we thought we would be, but um, we've been taking our time with the process. We don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Uh, we have some provisional, we, basically we're going to create some provisional adopted models for the first ones you know, with the understanding that they'll be stable but ultimately, they may be superseded as we get more uh, a larger body of, uh, of people involved in the consensus process. We need to go back and re-engage with some of the early contributors because uh, the, uh, we spent a lot of time on the language design and on the process, and, and a lot of the folks just want to get their models uh, adopted. So we, we need to go there. And um, <clears throat> it'll probably take a little while, so um, um, kind of maybe third quarter of this year, we'll have some provisional models out. Um, and it's almost really third quarter now. So I think we're, <laughs> we can't be behind yet. So the provisional models, um, we have some models from OCF representing appliance features and a uh, model from lightweight M to M based on their sensor model. We've um, decided on a, a process that sort of mirrors really what everybody does, but uh, in particular, OCF has has made put down a few sort of ground rules, like we only really want constructive feedback. In other words, make a concrete proposal that says what you want or how you think this model should be made better. And um, it's sort of like the role of an IETF chair that we can drive consensus and help break the deadlocks, but we really want the, the group to agree. And we sort of looked at this uh, chair role that's defined in RFC 2418 as a work group chair. And that, that sort of is a, is a good pattern for us to use as uh, going forward. So the provisional models we have are um, the, the ON. So basically, there's some ongoing uh, questions about how uh, sensors should be handled in quantities and units, as Adi mentioned earlier. Um, I don't know if we really talked about that too much in another slide, but um, here's the OCF models, and we're basically looking at things that uh, things that can be that don't really that don't overlap with a lot of other models. I, I, we had some some criteria for what models we wanted to select for the early revisions, and they were sort of non non controversial. We don't want to start with a thermostat model that we know someone is going to want to change. So. So we pulled these out of uh, um, the OCF uh, 
Canon, if you will, and they're, they're for modeling appliances. And they're the, some of the common things like the binary switch and the mode and the operational state. So you think of a, a mode as being, you know, a, a diagnostic mode or running mode or a failure mode or a, maybe a, a, a fan uh, mode that might be running one way or another. And then operational state is sort of what where you're going, uh, uh, if it's a dishwasher, you might have the rinse cycle, the wash cycle, the, the drying cycle, et cetera. And so those are all, and the on-off switch. So those are all really, really common patterns that you find in appliances. And we're gonna try to draw the, drive those forward in the uh, OCF, from the OCF canon, if you will. And then um, from OMA, we've, um, we're looking at a couple of sensors and there are a, a, a really a number of issues that we need to work out. And this is basically, just to give everyone a flavor of the kind of uh, questions and, and the kind of work we'll be doing in 1DM. Uh, so basically, uh, quantities and units is probably a good place to start because as Adi said, that th that really turns out to be a bigger issue than, than I expected it to be. But um, basically, you know, should we bind units to sensor type? And that's a really good question. Should, should a temperature sensor always report in Celsius or should we, um, basically have some uh, conversion ability or adaptation ability to different units. And, and of course, it, temperature is a good example because it, it has some alternate units. Many sensors don't, so it's not a problem. Um, we want to uh, basically see if it makes sense to have a common pattern because really all the sensors kind of report the same way. And the only thing that differs is the units and the scale. So that's really the, the, the crux of the, the, the question here is, should we have a bunch of definitions that are tied to units like a temperature sensor, a humidity sensor, a barometric pressure sensor, and so on? Or should there be um, a sensor, as in say, uh, BACnet has just a, a sensor, and then you, you have values that you put in and then you customize it according to engineering units you know, way down the road. And so there's really a range for a few different patterns here. Currently in the definitions contributed, they were, they were specialized per units, but um, it's not really clear that that's the, the best way to do things or if there should be two patterns and an alternate specialized sensors and a generic sensor, then people have a question of which one to use, et cetera. So that's basically uh, the flavor of it. And then, you know, a lot of the sensors are multi-sensors. And so how do you deal with that? Um, is there a way that we need to standardize the way multiple sensors are packed together. Particularly, uh, Bluetooth Mesh has a really good system for doing that from columnar data and timestamp series. But um, that's their way of doing it. And is that something that we could standardize? Or do we need to have some, some uh, consensus, sort of drive for some consensus around uh, a few different, you know, have a, a, I guess what you'd call a dialectic uh, approach, where we try to synthesize the best from a few different approaches. Right, so this is kind of my last slide to illustrate sort of a use case and what really we're driving for in industry. Um, it shows a semantic proxy where a sensor from one definition is exposed to a client that expecting a different definition. And if we have common uh, abstract high level models uh, as shown on the left, so there's an SDF model for what we're doing that it just simply has different protocol bindings for the different uh, and different packet formats and what have you. Um, the approach here would be that we would take the single definition and convert it to both OMA and OCF so that the uh, declarations would be compatible with, with their sensors and they can figure out what sensor they're talking about, for example, on the OCF side. And then um, basically create the thing models for both of those. Uh, as, as McCool mentioned earlier, we were gonna use uh, W3C thing description as an intermediate format here, uh, especially because there's some application software that already consumes these and knows how to work with them. So we would create a, a thing model for each, each one of these and a thing description that had the, the uh, protocol binding information for OMA on the consuming side and the protocol binding information for OCF, in this case, on the exposing side. And then the, uh, the software known as NodeWatt, which is actually an Eclipse project that knows how to consume and expose based on TVs, we could uh, create a proxy from that software and that would automatically consume 
essentially any 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 um, OMA server or device that has a definition in SDF and expose it as an OCF um, client. Now, I think something that Michael McCool was mentioning earlier is really interesting here. If there is a common web of things profile for how software clients access things, then this picture would have many different types of servers and devices on the bottom, OCF, OMA, uh, you know, lightweight MTM, Zigbee, uh, Bluetooth. And then the top part would be the common uh, web of things uh, profile client. So there's, there's another way of using this same basic technology. Let's see, I think that's all I had. There's some backup slides here that you can look at and then we kind of show how the workflow works and uh, for adopting models and, and uh, some of the stuff about who's involved and, uh, this is kind of interesting where uh, one little point where we're planning on providing um, a way for anyone to just host their models in SDF as a, as a way of um, standardizing the format without necessarily participating in the, uh, in the convergence process. Of course, the convergence process is the big value, but there's also a lot of value in just having an SDF model for things that, that can be easily adapted to. Uh, okay, not sure about time, but that's really all I have on on uh, my presentation. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, are there any questions? I think we gained a little time. <laughs> yes, you did, Eve. Mm -hmm. Oops, you're very quiet. I'm very quiet. How about this? Is this a little better? Yes, a little better. Yes. Now. Ah, okay. So, of course, I'm very curious about and have been interested continually in following the um, semantic proxy conversion diagram, which was your last slide, Michael. Yeah, that one, semantic proxy. And I was very interested to hear about the digital twin DTTL work that's emerging. And I know we um, talk about the numbers of models that exist in the repository. I wonder um, if you can also talk about, um, you know, kind of going forward, keeping track of the various conversions that are underway. And I, I presume that that's really, and it has always been the focus of the hackathons. Um, but, right. um, you know, sort of, I, I think a really interesting metric is how many, how many of these conversions in which directions are also um, emerging or under development. That would be interesting to hear about. Um, that, that is a really good idea and a metric because um, a, a little bit of disclosure, I've recently changed jobs and I'm now working for a company called Passive Logic and our main business is digital twins for buildings. So I'm not wow. going to be personally interested in as much about um, you know smart home devices anymore. <laughs> but um, I think that I'm looking at uh, conversions for DTDL to SDF and BACnet, and um, a new thing that we're developing called the quantum ontology, which is a physical physics ontology for building that has to do with enthalpy and things like that. So um, uh, that would add three new, <laughs> three or four new uh, conversions. So we could think about you know, you know th that uh, coming up with that. So far, though, there's only really a, a, a sort of a software uh, repo or, or um, open source sort of conversion. But I think if we could move these up to a sort of a high level status in, in, in terms of there's a conversion, uh, as the spec changes, the conversion changes, maybe not everyone's involved. Maybe this is just being pulled from an open source repo and being synced whenever they make an update. So there are a lot of different ways to do that. And I think that uh, your suggestion could be taken as a, a general sort of category of things to add to 1DM to what we talk about and track and, and manage. So I, I think that's that that sounds pretty good. And again, thanks for the the plug for moving uh, moving on to sort of digital twin work because I think that's a, a new emerging uh, a new emerging thing that that uh, creates almost a whole new uh, application area for something like this. And also this. Uh, this diagram here basically is a, a good uh, illustration of the kind of architecture that a digital twin would 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 use. It would normalize the data from a bunch of different sensors and 
actuators and the control affordances, and it would pre present a single sort of unified semantic interface to the uh, to the upper layers. And indeed, that's uh, one of the bigger questions about digital twin that helps you do the modeling because then you don't have to think about a lot of different protocols. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Michael? Yeah, I'm also interested in tracking the conversions. I think there are really good test case. To let us know uh, how compatible the different standards are and whether they're just modeling the same information in different ways. And so regardless of their practical utility, which I think they are very practical, I think having those conversions around really helps us test uh, our compatibility of our various information models. Um, in fact, to the extent that when I'm looking at like directory services, I'm thinking, you know, could we have a single information model and just serialize it in different formats? <clears throat> so I could certainly see a, you know, what thing directory service also providing maybe STF models uh, just a different way to serialize the same information if they are truly mm. interconnected. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, this is really input, uh, really useful input for the hackathon that we are going to have in in four weeks. Um, we have started in in the wishy activity to uh, collect pointers to tools, and maybe this is a. Uh, reminder mm -hmm. to update that mm -hmm. so we, we should be able to uh, have an inventory of uh, what uh, kinds of tools we uh, have available maybe that's something we can prepare uh, for the hackathon and then of course at the hackathon we can look a bit more more closely in, in what we actually can get uh, converted and uh, one one great thing that came out on on thursday when we uh, had our wishing meeting and, and talked to the Microsoft people about the Azure uh, DTDL uh, work is they now also have uh, some models out there. So the, the next thing that we will look at is how to get these models in into the repositories um, as well. And of course, there, there are other models that are waiting uh, for this. So, so we are either going to do this before the hackathon or at the hackathon. And I hope by the end of the hackathon, we have a much better overview of what we already have covered and where mm -hmm. additional work is required. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And I'm remembering Karsten really early on. In fact, even back at the uh, IAB semantic interoperability workshop, you had made a diagram of, of how translation works in general with the common format showing a box in the middle and arcs coming in and arcs going out. And really, the system we're building isn't just the box in the middle. It includes these arcs that come in and go out, which are, in, in fact, the conversions. So um, really, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, and having those as, as something a little bit higher level. Also, um, with digital twin and other kinds of, we're looking at physical uh, uh, models of things that aren't necessarily, they don't have the same kind of affordances. They're, they're mainly object property models, but they describe the physical uh, part of things that are connected to like, you know, the heaters and the, the, uh, the pump and the tank and things like that, condensers. So um, those things are also needed, but they don't necessarily get converted. They, they get expressed, or maybe they get converted if we're talking about something like uh, uh, OPC UA, where those models already exist. But that's also part of the ecosystem. We, we need to understand that SDF is going to be modeling more than just connected devices that you can talk to, but also the things that they connect to. Great. Any other things we want to do with the last 90 seconds we have on this <laughs> agenda item? Uh, so, Xavier, can you prepare your slides? Here we go. Good. Yep, thank you. Yeah, so I, I'd like to uh, present an update to our draft on IoT, uh, edge computing, challenges, and functions. Right, so in revision two, uh, which we are presenting today, 
we addressed comments from Milan and we made uh, also other related changes. So we will go through that in uh, the rest of the slides. We also uh, contacted some standard community members for comment, but for now we didn't get technical feedback, so we are still waiting. So let's start with a quick overview. Uh, this draft discusses some aspects of IoT edge computing. So why do we need it? How is it used today? And what are the research challenges we can identify? And so in section two, we provide some background. We list use cases. Uh, in section three, we list reasons that motivate the use of edge computing for IoT. And in section four, we have an overview of IoT edge computing today. We provide also a general model and a distributed version of this model. We then list uh, in the same uh, section four, uh, research challenges organized by functions or components. So they are loosely uh, classified as OEM, functional and application. And uh, well, one point is that the, those functions need to be at relatively high level so that you know they map to research challenges without too much overlap between them. So this 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 function is here to structure the, the research space in a way. Um, you know, then we have a section on simulation and emulation environments and one on security uh, considerations. So let's go through the updates. The the first comment stated that some use cases uh, felt to be generic and did not seem to exemplify the need for edge processing. So we think it's a fair comment. We rewrote a use case on smart construction and we deleted another one and we reordered the, the use cases. The second comment had basically two observations, uh, you know, from the fact that connectivity can be constrained um, and also it can be costly upstream and downstream. So basically there was a need to broaden some statements so we changed the title, we made the minor changes to um, basically uh, cover those additional aspects. And the third comment was that you know, it was about resilience and it provided some text to describe resilience today in uh, IoT, IoT deployments. So again, a, a very useful comment and we added text uh, closely based on this in uh, section 4.1. The next comment was that section four uh, should be revised, you know, the, the list of um, research uh, challenges should be revised to um, separate description of edge functions from the implementation mechanisms. It was also suggested to divide the description into key IoT functions and the list was provided. So we, we actually, we expanded the scope of some of the functions, you know, three of them are listed here. Uh, we did some reorganization and uh, quite a lot of uh, text updates as well. So hopefully we cover the areas listed in the comment and we, uh, you know, all of them and at the right level. The next comment was that uh, the section of on edge caching should clarify that the edge node may offer local data storage and caching. So based on that, we updated and retitled the section to, to include both local storage and caching. Uh, we also uh, added uh, new research challenges uh, corresponding to recent papers. Uh, uh, they are added in references. In ref so uh, basically, if you want to check them, uh, you know, because the diff is a bit uh, difficult to read, so you can look at the diff of the reference section and basically lo look them up in the in the text, they will correspond to new challenges or extensions of ex existing ones. And th those are basically 2021 20, papers. So finally, uh, we did um, some editorial changes as well. Right, so uh, to our knowledge, all outstanding comments are addressed. The draft is in a stable state. Uh, additional comments are welcome. And uh, finally, I'd like also to take, a, you know, a for, for us to, to discuss whether it makes sense to start a last call. Uh, is this the right moment? So it could help uh, elicit uh, some final comments. The authors uh, agree that this document is ready as far as we can tell, right? 
So this uh, completes this presentation. Thank you for your attention and uh, thank you, uh, Milan, for, for your comments. Thank you, Xavier. Michael? I actually read this twice and made a bunch of comments and never managed to get the process of sending them to you. So uh, if you'd like, I can try one more time, because I did find a bunch of stuff in the earlier versions, but it may have been addressed already. But uh, I can certainly do pass over it, and this time trying to figure out how to get the comments to you in a way you can use. Uh, Tell me how to do that. Definitely, that, that would be great, Michael. And uh, if you don't have, even if you don't have time, you know, it's fine if you send some comments, which were already covered. It's really not, not a big deal. Uh, no, don't worry well, about it. Well, the problem is I had, I had a lot. And it was just uh, difficult to, to, I just didn't want to write them up in a big long email. So if there's a way I can edit the document itself and do a diff or do a PR or something, that would be ideal. I just couldn't figure out what the tooling you're using. And uh, so let's just discuss this offline. Uh, sounds good. Yeah, we, we, we have, it's on GitHub. So yeah, we, that's not a problem. Yeah. Uh, I, I can send uh, uh, again the, the link to the GitHub repository on the list, if you like, yeah, or, or to you, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think as a reviewer, I, I can sympathize with that a lot. Uh, so there, there are often uh, comments where, where you just say, hey, why don't you say it this way? And it's much easier to just edit uh, the, the document and, and uh, submit this as a mm -hmm. uh, pull request. So uh, yeah, I think that, that's I, I, a... Yeah, I do recall now I checked it out and got it to compile. So it just got, I ran out of time and then the new version came out and my comments were no longer valid, right? So I just need to get it all done quickly. So I guess I'll have to find some time to sit down and just do it for the third version, third time. Yeah. So um, I think that, that's also one thing that, that uh, we learned. Uh, it, it's really best to submit comments in, in smaller pieces. So if you do a review and uh, you have done the partial one, don't don't wait until you have time to <laughs> actually complete the thing. Send it on to the authors; they can do something useful with that, and you can always go back to to uh, reviewing the the next uh, uh, version of the document. So I think that that's a pretty important uh, thing. Um, also, when when you have these these monster pull requests, it's sometimes hard to to integrate them in particular if you get two at the same point in time. So keep it small, keep it simple, and keep it timely. I think that that's the advice I would give to people who want to do this pull request. Yeah, I would say that my, my, my intention here would be to create an issue and then do a small PR for each issue, not to have one big PR. Yeah. Understood. Yeah, that, that may be also be overwhelming because you might have 20 PRs in the end, uh, but so the truth may be somewhere in the middle, but I think the important point is actually sending things incrementally so you, you don't create a lot of delay. But I'm, I'm hearing from this that, that people are, are actually interested in uh, getting a few more um, reviews in. And I think it's also time for, for the chairs to uh, prov provide uh, reviews so we, we are getting ready uh, for the, the research group um, last call. So we will spend some more time doing these uh, reviews and then uh, probably issue the research group last call in the fall. And whatever we can do before that uh, really helps speed up the, the uh, research group last call. Good. Any any other Thanks. observations about this draft? Well, th thank you, uh, Michael and Karsten. Yeah. Okay. So when we're done with this, let's go to the initial security uh, setup. Mohit, can you can you? Uh, Show your slides. Uh, I hope you can hear me fine. Yes. Uh, 
and hopefully and we'll now you can see in full screen yes yeah okay uh so uh i guess good evening for those of you in europe and morning or late evening for for others in different time zones my name is mohit and together with my co-authors bachat and dan uh, we have been working on this document which is currently titled as secure iot bootstrapping a survey uh the change since the last idf is that the document is officially adopted as a research group item uh we haven't really made changes to the content uh, but i guess the goal of today's presentation and interim meeting is to um present some suggestions that uh, we have on on possible future directions for this document and get feedback uh, from all of you before we actually go and edit uh the draft and uh, a lot of the the changes and suggestions are actually coming coming not not from the authors but from working group chairs and and members like Karsten so uh, a lot of the material that uh, we'll be presenting today is actually based off uh, off of a presentation from Karsten Borman in the IoT Ops uh, working group uh so uh just to recap why does this document exist and what are we trying to do with this so the goal was that there is uh, so many different uh, bootstrapping protocols so we thought like maybe having a document uh trying to summarize some of the common uh, uh bootstrapping protocols would make sense and when we started doing that uh more and more new protocols from different uh, standards organizations uh, came up and obviously not all of them were even using sa similar or same terminology and uh, over time our goal then also became to not just document the protocols and solutions from uh, different SDOs but also to kind of uh, provide an overview of what uh, are the different terms used uh, for bootstrapping uh, another goal is to identify common patterns so uh, and provide recommendations on applicability of terms so with common patterns i guess by now many of you have seen this uh, common interaction in smart home environments where you are expected to either scan some qr code or or something of that sorts before your iot device can join your home network so uh, uh, different uh, protocols and SDOs may call it a companion device or a configurator, for example, but it's essentially the same purpose and, and the same pattern. So one of the goals was to identify these common patterns. Uh, then, uh, obviously, we can't list all uh, examples of bootstrapping techniques, but uh, we pick and choose some illustrative examples. So we try to cover um, those that are significantly different in in terms of user interaction, in terms of <clears throat> what kind of credentials they expect before the protocol starts and uh, what do they achieve. So for example, some protocols may only configure uh, the network and, and uh, not configure like application settings and so on. So they might just configure the SSID and passphrase so that your device can join uh, the network and connect to the internet but the rest of the things like uh, configuring the name of uh, the device or like adding it to different groups um, you might have to do them with another protocol whereas some others might build systems where they include everything from uh, uh, connecting the device to the network to configuring uh, application parameters and and so on we did try to initially classify these bootstrapping techniques uh, using some traditional methodology like managed and unmanaged and leap of faith methods but we soon realized that uh, it's actually pretty hard to classify them some of them are obviously easy and straightforward and fall into one or the other category but many of them uh, fall into this uh, generic category of hybrid methods where they might do this or might do that and in some situations they support this and obviously uh, you know anyone who is uh, writing a protocol specification wants it uh, to address as many use cases as as possible 
so it often happens that uh, in some cases it's uh, in one category whereas in in other cases it's in another category so there are very few protocols that say we only address uh, uh, small enterprise or something uh, i think many of them would say we address home and sm small enterprise and maybe also like full enterprise experience so so uh, moving on so we started documenting the terminology and the current list uh, which we have in the draft and and here on the slide so we immediately realized that there's lots of similar terms that are being used in this context there's bootstrapping provisioning onboarding initialization registration uh, commissioning uh, configuration discovery uh, there may be like a uh, couple of others which uh, we may have missed and if you know please uh, type it into the chat now or send an email and this draft is on github so you're also welcome to send pull requests so immediately we realize is even is the title of the draft correct uh, because uh, we call this secure bootstrapping secure iot bootstrapping survey but if bootstrapping is not uh, the only term that is used in this context what should the draft be called and uh, uh, we got a nice suggestion from Karsten of uh, using initial security setup as kind of an overarching term that uh, includes uh, the essence of all these uh, terms uh, basically that you want to do the initial security setup of, of an IoT device and uh, the suggested new title is uh, terminology and processes for initial security setup of IoT devices and obviously we look forward to your feedback if this makes sense. The other idea we got from Karsten was uh, to actually break down protocols into uh, three things. So first is to identify the players, uh, basically who are the parties involved. So typically it might be the manufacturer of the IoT device, uh, it might also be the end user of the IoT device. Uh, the end user of an IoT device may be different from an owner of an IoT device. So your IoT device may be owned by the company you work for, but you might be the end user. So some protocols may end up distinguishing users and owners. Uh, there's also network administrators which may control or manage uh, devices. So these could be uh, players. Uh, then the second uh, kind of block, building block for these uh, protocols is uh, beliefs. And what we realized is that there are some beliefs that these protocols start with and then some beliefs that they instill during uh, the protocol execution. So it's quite common that many protocols assume that devices come with some certificates installed by the manufacturer and these certificates contain different kind of uh, uh, you know things like IDEV ID or it may not even be a certificate it might just be a pre-shared secret or other forms of trust anchors and and the next presentation will be exactly about these kind of things of what uh, what kind of credentials a device may come with uh, and then uh, once this initial security setup is complete, uh, what information is actually configured on the device? So typically this may include like SSID, network key, even some protocols like uh, configure the initialization vector that should be used by the device. So all these uh, things would be the post setup beliefs that are instilled into the device during the process. And uh, the third building block for these protocols is the actual processes. So the sequence of events that uh, must be done for this security setup. So um, many times it's uh, powering up the device. Uh, it may involve like scanning a QR code that, that is on the box of the device in which it was shipped or the device itself. It may be tapping NFCs. It may be like accepting some uh, checkbox on your companion device like a smartphone, but basically uh, what, uh, kind of interactions are required and and there are uh, many protocols that actually don't require uh, anything from the user so uh, you i'm sure all of you have heard about this uh, uh, zero interaction uh, protocols where the user doesn't really have to do anything 
So I have taken two examples of protocols and then tried to break them down into these building blocks of uh, players, beliefs, and processes. So the first one is device provisioning protocol. A brief description of this protocol is already in the draft. So it's a protocol from Wi-Fi Alliance for configuring uh, Wi-Fi based IoT devices and it relies on a configurator, which is a smartphone and the IoT devices themselves are called enrollees. Uh, it has three sub protocols. So bootstrap where you typically scan a QR code or tap NFC uh, for the device. Then there is a actual exchange that happens between the smartphone and, and the IoT device where uh, authentication happens. And typically it's uh, uh, authentication in one direction where like the IoT device is authenticated, but the protocol allows you to do uh, authentication in both the, both the directions. It would just require that not only the smartphone scans the QR code, you will also need the other, other direction in, in some form. So whether the IoT device scans the QR code as well or uses some other uh, mechanism to transfer the public keys is kind of left open. Uh, but it is possible to do mutual authentication, although most most deployments would do only only one way. And then finally, once the authentication is complete, the smartphone will configure uh, or install uh, information such as the SSID and passphrase. So quite straightforward uh, protocol and user experience. So let's look at the players. So there's the manufacturer, uh, which installs a key pair and then ensures that the public key and other metadata of the uh, of the device that is uh, being shipped uh, is available on the device or on its packaging. There's uh, the user, which in most cases is then also treated as the owner of the device and a companion uh, smartphone, which is used for completing the process. Uh, beliefs that exist before the protocol is executed. So basically it's the manufacturer installed asymmetric key pair and after the setup is done, the device is instilled with knowledge such as the SSID and passphrase it should use to connect to the internet. And the process is uh, user scanning a QR code or tapping NFC. If mutual authentication is desired, then it's done twice in, in both directions. And generally the user kind of configures uh, the SSID and passphrase of his home router that the IoT device should uh, connect to. So the second protocol uh, that uh, I wanted to cover today was Bluetooth. One of the reasons was this uh, for covering Bluetooth, and this is currently not in the draft. Uh, it just says uh, to be done. Uh, and Aaron Ding complained at the last T2TRG meeting when it will be done. So at least now we have it on the slides, and hopefully after this meeting, I'll add this information to the draft as well. So Bluetooth Mesh calls provisioning, similar to DPP, which is device provisioning protocol. Bluetooth Mesh calls this process of initial security setup as provisioning. And as is uh, quite common, there is a device which is unprovisioned and, and needs to be provisioned, and then a smartphone, which kind of helps the user in the process uh, to do that. It begins uh, with the invitation, so the device uh, uh, sends out beacons saying I'm unconfigured, uh, please configure me. A smartphone will discover these beacons and then send an invitation that, hey, I, I could configure you. And the new device would say, here are my capabilities. So these are the uh, cryptographic algorithms I support. These are my IO capabilities and, and these are like elements uh, that are part of the device. So elements is basically, if you think of a light strip, then each, each individual light would be an element. Uh, that's how at least Bluetooth Mesh uh, defines them. There's a public key exchange that happens after this. So it's a typical elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman key exchange with uh, fresh keys. Uh, and this happens if uh, OOB input or OOB output authentication method is used. So OOB here stands for out of band. So if out of band authentication is used, then typically a fresh ECDH key exchange happens. And thereafter, there is a actual transfer of data on an out of band channel and bluetooth actually allows sending this data as a blinking led light or as audio noise so uh, you could think of this uh, configuring like some bluetooth speakers for example 
this is shown as the green arrow in the diagram. Thereafter, Bluetooth, uh, both, both the smartphone and the unprovisioned device exchange uh, what Bluetooth specification calls as confirmation messages, but I would rather call them commitment messages. So both the sites commit to some random numbers, and once that is done, they reveal the random numbers to kind of verify that there was no man in the middle uh, attacker uh, during this protocol exchange. Uh, finally, once this uh, uh, shared key is set up uh, between the smartphone and the new device, that is used to like protect data uh, which is being sent to the unconfigured device. So this data can include the network key, uh, unicast address that the device should use, and, and other information such as the IV index and, and so on. So to look at uh, the building blocks for this protocol, the, pl the players in this case are a user and provisioner. So you might immediately notice that in this case, the manufacturer of the device is not really a player at least in the mode of provisioning that I have shown in the slides. Bluetooth also has other, other modes of provisioning where the manufacturer may install a key pair and, and print a QR code, but just to kind of show a variation of that process, Bluetooth also allows where manufacturer is not allowed, so you see only user and provisioner. Uh, there is no pre-setup belief, so there are no hard-coded credentials in the device. And after the execution of this initial security setup process, the device learns the target network credentials, whether it's a lighting application and, and so on, and whether this light is in the kitchen or bedroom and, and things like that. The process, uh, depending on the actual deployment, might be that the user has to scan a blinking light or like li listen to some noise that is being made, made by the speaker and eventually send information like which group uh, does this device belong to and what application keys does it have access to. That's it. Uh, the draft is uh, currently on GitHub. Uh, I look forward to your feedback on this suggested direction makes sense or uh, how to modify it and improve it further. Okay, thank you. So I think the, the same observation applies uh, uh, that uh, since the thing is on GitHub, it, it may be very easy to uh, put up issues there or, or make text suggestions there. But of course, we also welcome the traditional review sent to the uh, mailing list. So if you have a small thing, maybe the issue is the right way to do this or a short notice to the mailing list, of course, also is uh, the right thing. So, but can, can you say a little bit more about the, the timeline you see for the next steps of this? Uh, I guess uh, I would like to get at least the updated uh, content, some of the updated content ready before the cutoff for July IETF. Um, but uh, yeah, after that, it depends a little bit also on getting some some feedback on on the content that is there. So obviously, uh, all the authors have been also busy, and we have been a little bit slacking, and we'll try to make up for that. So hopefully, there should be a new version before the cutoff for July, and after that, it depends on what kind of feedback we get. If this direction is like am amenable to the rest of the research group, then uh, uh, it would be simply like b breaking down other protocols into the players' beliefs and processes. Okay, any comments or questions on the draft and, and on Moritz's presentation? Michael. Well, I think that, that um, um, this is Michael Richardson. I think that uh, the proposed revisions to the art, to the structure of the document are really good. Um, I guess, as Mohit said, there's a fair bit of work to do to, to reorganize it uh, that way. Um, and so I guess I'm really looking forward to that thing. And I really like this, uh, the, the, the process that in slides three or four or whatever it was, 
that he proposed. I think it's great, um, but I think that uh, we just need to get to that point somewhere. Um, yeah, that's the breakdown. Yep. Yeah, exactly. I really like that. I think that's a really good thing. Um, and I think that it will maybe provide a good, um, for future documents that people write about uh, this thing, they will hopefully uh, um, provide, you know, a clear clarity on this. Um, and I think it would also provide, I don't know that this, I don't know that this document needs to go actually talk about very many examples, but I guess it's good to talk to about those that we know about. Um, I really hope that there might be somebody in this working group that is a um, able to provide these details on the chip matter uh, stuff in an authoritative fashion um, for it, because I think that would be timely to, be, to include that. Uh, but I said we don't need to meet. We don't need to do this extensively. We need to do it um, represent it representationally, so that you have some idea of how to apply it to existing things and in the future. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the feedback. I agree that uh, it cannot be an exhaustive uh, list of protocols, but we try to cover important ones and and make sure that there is like different uh, enough that they represent like all the variations that exist in these processes. Yeah, I think one, one um, as Michael said, one, one of the, the important benefits from this document might be that we have uh, an example, a model for how you would uh, talk about a specific uh, bootstrapping approach, uh, onboarding approach. So we have the right words to talk about uh, these things. And um, so, for instance, if if people are coming up with new models, they would be able to describe it in a way that that it can be compared with existing ones. Of course, unless they want to obfuscate how their stuff works, which also sometimes happens. So my my Gabriel. Yes, um, sort of piling on what uh, Michael Richardson said. Uh, so yeah, sure, not uh, to to list. Uh, I don't think we should list every single one, but um, let me offer another one in addition to matter that might be important. Uh, Fido issued recently uh, uh, an IoT um, security uh, spec, so that one might be might be relevant just because FIDO is, is, is very, very prevalent in authentication space uh, already. Um, and the another thing that comes to mind is NIST has issued guidelines for um, IoT security. And it would be good to see, um, maybe it would be an extra section to see of the, of the NISTs of the world or the government guidance, which ones of the reviewed uh, uh, comply or how do they comply sort of to give uh, guidance to folks who might be interested in going one step beyond and actually contempt contemplating adoption because once you contemplate adoption then things like what governments are uh, government guidance becomes fairly important I think at least for a certain style of deployments yeah thanks Gabriel for the feedback uh, Fido is uh currently at least in the draft. Uh, it's described what the protocol does. Obviously, it's not uh, described in the fashion that the slides currently suggest. So this was more like uh, asking for feedback. And it seems people seem to support this uh, direction of breaking down protocols into players' beliefs and processes. So I would do that for FIDO as well. Uh, it will be there. Uh, regarding the NIST, uh, I'll have to look at the, the specification itself on how well it covers this bootstrapping and what to do about it. Uh, but sure, I'll, I'll take a note of it and uh, come, come back to you at the next uh, interim or meeting.
Okay. So okay. Um, yeah. I hope that the the uh, prediction I made in in the introduction that this is a twenty twenty ish a twenty twenty two ish uh, document uh, will come true. Maybe a bit hard to finish it during this year, but uh, we might get it in in a status where we can uh, do most of the process uh, this year. So I'm looking forward uh, to this uh, document uh, being processed. So, Michael, do you want to? Yeah. Okay. Uh, where is it? Yes. The, the funny thing is that uh, if the two chairs press on the button at the same point in time, one of them will press a random button. Uh... Oh. <laughs> Not very good. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about this IDEV ID considerations document and kind of relate it back to Mohit's document. And for those who are watching, we did exchange slides, so somewhat should if, if it's if it's if it's coordinated, it should look that way. Um, so an experience I went through with um, a couple of uh, sort of non ITF reviewers and some you know, there's a list called Dumpster Fire um, out there uh, as well um, and. Uh, Basically, what I encountered at some point was that there's a certain amount of skepticism as to, you know, oh, well, PKI will never be secure because someone will just screw it up and the manufacturer won't know what they're doing. They'll forget what's going on and other stuff. And then other people said, oh, no, 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 that won't happen because they're going to do blah, 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 blah. And then, then they sped it off 27 processes. And I realized that, um, that while the truth is probably somewhere in between, that either, either viewpoint kind of... Uh, uh, puts a kibosh on things. Either people think, oh, I can't never trust this thing, um, or they think, oh, it's going to be so complicated that no one will ever implement it. Um, and so I realized as I started talking to uh, a number of different uh, entities that do create these things and do operate them, um, both for purposes of remote attestation and for other things that, well, of course, none of them were willing to talk about the details of how, why theirs was was sufficiently secure but not excessively secure and um that why it was useful and so this is where this document came about to kind of provide some um analysis of what's going on so how does it relate to this so we have uh, i i should have called this players but it's the manufacturer the manufacturing player and they do things um and then we have some process of onboarding whether it's called initialization or registration or onboarding um, and then we have some kind of operational process that involves software updates that may involve discovery of the device once it's on the network, backup of the configuration and the settings. That's actually something often forgot, particularly uh, is very, very critical in industrial settings um, because they really need to be able to restore the, the configuration essentially uh, when they replace the device. Um, and there may also be some discovery here that happens as part of onboarding and um, there's some back and forth there. So for instance, Mohit's uh, um, previous slide about Bluetooth mesh onboarding, that there's a definite discovery process that's um, involved in that. Um, and sometimes it's it's there not. Um, and so this is where, this is the kind of, this is how I view, this is my view, if you like, of, of Mohit's document of how I think about it. And I took, I tried to take as many of the words out of this as possible. And if I had a cool, uh, 3D thing, this would now morph and the yellow part on the left would now turn into this part here for you and you'd have a, a really, you know, uh, a 3D experience as as I as I change the orientation of this type of thing. So what I'm actually interested in is now going into the third dimension of that, that box um, and talking, and this is what my document tries to do is to connect the two things. So um, in some cases, there's uh, the manufacturer, what they do, in particularly in the silicon space is that uh, they provision some kind of shared secret into the silicon and they provide it to the next people down the chain who may do something. And as far as I can tell, um, this is probably, you know, transmitted in the form of Excel file or something like this or CSV file uh, securely transported. And if you have visions of that Johnny Mnemonic movie, I think that you're thinking the right way because I think that's actually the kind of level of security that people need to think about here. Um, but the next step here is you you uh, 
create an IDEV ID, and that requires some kind of a certification authority to do something like this um, and uh, to sign them for in, in a device unique way. And then you put some kind of a, a root CA on top of that because the CA that's running in the factory is perhaps only the one that runs for a couple of months or maybe a year at most. And then you cycle it, get a new private key and things like that. And that's uh, um, what this document talks about. How do these things go together? Uh, how do we number the layers of these things? Because I've shown two in this diagram plus an end entity certificate. Um, and you could imagine two or even three or in some cases only one. Um, so then on the other side, um, there's trust anchors and they get used for a bunch of things. And you see that there's a difference of an arrow here because while well, the IDEF ID goes in, the certificate goes in with the private key already being in the device. Um, and the trust anchor, the public key goes in and the pi private key is held somewhere in the factory um, or in, the, in a vault in many cases, um, if it's the root CA that you're going to point to. And what are you going to do with this? Well, you're going to ha probably have a code signing and entity certificate. Um, and that's going to be used in a protocol like suit um, or other things uh, to verify that the so new software is correct. And in some cases, for instance, in, in uh, Brewski, for instance, we have a voucher signing and entity certificate that you need to have as well. And there's other protocols that have other kinds of anchors that you need to include. And so then part of the other part of this document is to understand, well, what, how do we do the security around this process, right? What is the human factors around this and what pieces can we understand this? So for instance, was there one, does the secret held by one person or by three people or seven people? Do you need four people to put the secret back together or or two? Um, and that's just a number that that is there. Is Is three better than four? I don't know, and I'm not trying to say so one way or the other. Um, clearly, the more pieces you have, the more likelihood it is that some those people could be compromised or uh, uh, compelled to reveal the secret. Um, so that's a downside, you might say. On the other hand, the more pieces you have, the more likely it is that they don't get killed in a bus by a bus, um, or if you're trying to bring up a new plant in a new continent, that they're still able to travel to that continent during a pandemic to bring something up. And that's a sort of consideration that you may actually have to think, oh, wait a minute, what can I continue operations um, during a travel restrictions? And for the DNSSEC, for instance, the, the last year, um, they actually, as I understand it, last June, they got the drills out and they drilled open the vault um, because they couldn't actually have all the right people travel uh, to uh, the uh, to California to re-sign the DNSSEC route. And so there was a process that I guess they understood well uh, where they physically um, attacked themselves, I guess, um, on video. And um, that happened. Um, so, of course, the other CA could have also uh, a split that may be a different thing. It might have different characteristics as things, and that's part of the goal. If we're going to convince these uh, reviewers, security reviewers, that this anchor is actually properly taken care of, then you need to actually sit down and go, well, what, what, how is it taken care, care of, and what does that mean? And then there's a final thing that you might think about is, is that the same CA? Um, and it could be. And um, there's some good reasons to make it the same CA and there's some good reasons to make it a different CA. And all I really want to do with this document and have a manufacturer say, yes, no, that's all. Um, these are questions that I want to ask. And so really what I want to get in this document is the, what are the list of questions that we would like to have an answers for? Um, and we're putting no value judgment on whether which is better. That's it from me. So what's your trajectory, your plan trajectory for this document? Is that something so I, that... <laughs> yeah. I would like the T2G RG to adopt it. That would be my preference. I would be very happy to take uh, co-authors on it. Um, I really want to be able to reference this in two documents on operational considerations um, that uh, have been written in the uh, for the ANMO working group. Um, I think that there will be other things that may be quite willing to to reference it um, and all of these other onboarding type mechanisms, I think, 
should be able to quite easily say uh, what's going on and which ones apply to them. Um, and so this wouldn't apply in most cases, this, this analysis wouldn't apply to uh, the FIDO onboarding system, but rather to the um, uh, Qualcomm implementation of the FIDO onboarding system. And so Qualcomm would say, what, what is their policy? They, or what are they doing and how are they doing it? Um, and they don't need to tell us our details. They don't need to tell us the names of the secret splitted people. That's completely in, in, uninteresting. What's interesting is that we can understand what level of, 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 uh, caution they've taken and of course with every level of caution comes a corresponding uh kind of inverse level of of operational impediment right um in many cases so how do you see this document interact with uh, the one we discussed before well that's an interesting question um i think that uh while we could do some amount of, of uh, cooperation between them in terms of terminology. I would like to adopt whatever terminology the, uh, the other document is proposing. So I think that's a commonality. Uh, so I would think this document needs to reference the other document for the, the different steps and the different things that go on. Um, I'm not sure if there's references the other direction that make any sense. Um, but if there are, then of course we could do them. Um, but I don't, I see them as being, uh, related, but not necessarily, uh, co-involved. I don't think it would make sense to merge them in any way, for instance. Okay. So th this document would essentially play the role, uh, that some of the other examples that are in the other document play or is there something different about your document it is not a use case that the other document would look at but rather it is uh looking at a particular well so you know so this is my view this is my view of the other document right and so i'm interested in what's in the yellow box that supports the rest of it and so if you like as i said Think of this as now driving in the third dimension up and down into your screen. And what does that mean for this? So, so I would expect this kind of activity to be mentioned in the first document um, that, for instance, you the a player being a manufacturer may prepare a, an IDEV ID or some kind of other, um, some cases are still producing per customer SKUs with per customer secrets, for instance. Um, and that's something that can happen, that can be explained and can be done, right? Um, uh, but that when you want to go details as to what is the manufacturer actually doing, um, then you, the, my document is what matters. And it could be that in the Bluetooth mesh, for instance, situation, well, that's not an example where the manufacturer was there, but the DPP situation, different manufacturers may in fact produce devices that have different security properties because they build them in different factories which have different security properties and i don't think it's the role of the the protocol review to say something about the uh characteristics of the of the individual devices but rather of the class of the onboarding or uh, process so it could be up to this amount of security if the manufacturer does the most security and it could be the, le the least this least amount of security if the manufacturer does the minimum amount but if you want to know what amount the manufacturer actually does, then you need to know, you need to ask the manufacturer for their, you know, RFC 1234 statement. And then you'd get that statement and say, oh, okay, so I can't use this in medical things because you didn't do enough uh, due diligence on your security, but I can use this in my house, right? Okay, I think that that's an interesting way to to kind of specialize the the more general approach that the other uh, document has, and um, I think that's some, something we can benefit for, uh, from, in particular with respect to getting a feel for uh, how levels of security might be. Um, expressed because that that's not certain, uh, currently something that 
we have a lot of grasp for. I mean, we, we have bits of security. We can distinguish 128 bits from 256, but we don't really have levels of security for particular operational uh, considerations. Right. And, and I'm not actually asking to, to establish levels of security. I think that's outside of the ITF and the IRTF's uh, 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 um, uh, view. That needs to be established by somebody else. But in the, you just used one one parameter, levels of bits of security, right? And so that's a that's a question. You can say what is your what, what is your AES bit level count, and someone can answer that. Um, but as we know, that's maybe completely meaningless if the two hundred fifty six bit bit key is printed on the side of the building, right? So that's what we're asking, right? Is is okay? You've got this thing, and where does it go? What does it happens to it? Okay, so um, how, how do we get those reviews? So who, who would be interested in, in actually putting some uh, review of this uh, document up? I see Mohit. Uh, I can obviously volunteer to review. Uh, I joined the queue to say that uh, if you are going to adopt this, I think we'll need to like obviously involve the ops uh, people in the IETF to look at this, and perhaps also like uh, uh, if the chairs can help like get reviews from the actual manufacturers and CEAs uh, to kind of make sure that the processes that that are written in the draft uh, uh, reflect what is happening in inside their organizations. So uh, I don't actually, think we need to. I've actually pr presented the document to about six manufacturers at this point, and most of them were nodding. Um, getting them to actually write some kind of comments about it has been difficult to pull pull teeth. Um, but um, I think that with the pandemic waning, I think that we I will be able to come back and. Uh, um, get some more of their time so i've actually done a lot of that already in the past year um and uh i i i in many cases they're like huh i got to think about what i can say and what i can't say under nda and uh that's what's actually taking them time is they just can't walk into the lawyer's office and say well what can i do I think in the long run we will have to mix in some some attestation uh, considerations as well because all these uh, uh, systems, of course, need to maintain their trustworthiness. Uh, uh, so I think we will put some of this uh, in there as well. So so you know, there's also some uh, other aspects. So that's actually written in some of the document. Is there? Um, and so using your IDEV ID or some other key that you have uh, provisioned for the purpose of signing evidence um, is also is, is one of the things the manufacturer provides um, as well. Right. Uh, yeah, I'll just... Uh kind of respond to Michael, that's great that you have presented and at least I'm not expecting them to like write uh, comments on the list or I don't know, review the draft or anything like that. It's just good to know that they have kind of seen your presentation and not, not to it. So kind of indicating that whatever is there is correct. So that's, that's a, what I was looking for. And that's, I think, enough for me. Uh, but the rest uh, is, I would yeah. like them to write a, an email that I could share publicly that says we have read the document and we don't see anything that we couldn't, you know, uh, we couldn't uh, reply to. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting discussion. How we do we actually elicit this information? I think in the end we will also need to to involve people who make regulations uh, and, and discuss with them what they actually might be eliciting from from manufacturers uh, so that yeah. that might be an interesting other part of the conversation um and, it seems we're over time Michael, you about finish your thought uh, i was just going to say that that 
that this is why it's a taxonomy because we not we're not we we really don't want to make a judgment about any of the content we really want the regulators to say and therefore this number shall be at least 12 or something right and our goal is just to figure out what is the number 12 actually what is what is 12 actually what are the units for the number 12 uh what are the units that 12 is denominated in or whatever the yeah. word is they say Okay, thank you, Michael. So we, we're at the end of uh, our time and at the end of the uh, agenda. Again, we, we will have a hackathon in July. We will have another research group meeting at some point in uh, uh, September. So um, I think what is left to be done is uh, wishing everybody a great uh, summer and uh, talk to you soon. Great. Thank you, everyone. Talk to you soon again. Thanks, everybody.